warm welcome to our service here at Alconbury Independent Baptist Church. Uh, thank you for being patient with us. We just had a few technical glitches this morning, but we're thankful to be in the Lord's house, and we're thankful that you've joined us to, uh, with our service this morning. We're going to open by sing, reading a, a verse from the scriptures, uh, from Psalm 134. Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary, and bless the Lord. The Lord that made heaven and earth, bless thee out of Zion. And that is from Psalm 134. And our opening hymn this morning is, And Can It Be? And Can It Be? Number 203 in our hymn books. And Can It Be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me to him to death pursued. Amazing love, how can it be that, oh my God, should die for me? His conversion to Christ. And he was amazed at the amazing love of God. Thank you.
Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Are you not amazed, dear Christian, this morning that God should ever love us? That God should ever send his son to save us from our sin? That God should love us with an everlasting love? And that love was demonstrated in the gift of his son when the most famous scripture in the Bible, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Are you not amazed at his saving love, his preserving love, his keeping love? Well, that's what Charles Wesley reminds us of. Did you notice, long my imprisoned spirit lay, in verse 3, fast bound in sin and nature's night, thine eye diffused a quickening ray, I woke the dungeon flamed with light, my chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Well, let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our mighty and glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank thee for this hour we can have this morning in thy presence to worship thee. We're amazed at thy love. We're amazed at thy saving power in our lives. We thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast loved us with an everlasting love. The Bible says that God has loved us with an everlasting love, and therefore he'll never cease to love us. We thank thee for thy saving power and for thy grace in our lives. We thank thee, O Lord, that thy Father has loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him would not perish but have everlasting life. O oh Lord, there may be some this morning listening in who would think they're Christians. We pray, speak to their hearts. They're, they're long imprisoned in sin and nature's night. And we pray, Lord, oh, that thy love would soften them and draw them and save them. We thank thee, O Lord, that the gospel is still going out across the airwaves and across the broadcast, and we thank thee for this facility. And we pray, Lord, in thanksgiving for all thy mercies to us. Speak to our hearts, draw near to us, help us to listen to the reading of scripture as well as the preaching of the gospel, and use, O Lord, this service for thy glory. Forgive us our every sin, wash us of every iniquity, Oh, that our lives would be transformed by the gospel and oh, that our hearts will be aflame with a love for the Lord Jesus, a constant love for us that we would love him more consistently and more faithfully, more diligently, more obediently and that he may get all the glory. We thank thee for all thy mercies to us this week. Be with us and keep us this day for Jesus' sake. Amen. Good morning. Our reading this morning is from Luke chapter 10 verses 25 to 37. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbour as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbour? And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, 
and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbour unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. So ends the reading of God's word to us this morning. Thank you, Brother Vince. Much appreciated. We're now going to have some notices. And God willing, the upcoming meetings this week are a prayer meeting on Wednesday evening at 6.30 online. And I know friends have been encouraged by those prayer meetings. We've been able to pray for the needs of the church, the needs of members of the church, the, the gospel needs in our church, and also needs for our missionaries, and especially the needs of our world in this time. These are confusing times for many, but we have the certain truth of God's word to guide us through these times. We also have a Bible study that's ongoing in Second Timothy, um, and that is uploaded to our YouTube channel. I know friends have been finding it difficult to find them. I hope you can find them uh, going forward. Uh, they're all there on the AIBC YouTube channel, and there are other services that are available for you to view at your own in your own time. Next Lord's Day, God willing, we'll have our morning service at 10:45. Uh, to be broadcast live, and we trust that that will be a blessing. Uh, we'll return to our series and behold our God. So be praying for that, friends, and invite others to join us and to worship together. And also uh, just a highlight of perhaps in July when uh, the government gives us a uh, opportunity to meet together in a more restricted capacity, we'll let you know as soon as that is possible. We'll now come to the Lord in prayer, but before that, if this is a gospel message this morning, so if you're interested in finding out more about the gospel or about Christianity, please get in touch. Our details are there found on our website, and also, of course, you can contact us through the social media um, facilities that you're viewing at the moment on Facebook or even on YouTube. We can pray for people in our church this week. Uh, though there are friends who have lost loved ones. We're remembering particularly the, the Hearts. Um, Mr. Hart, uh, his brother, passed away in um, Australia uh, during, a couple of weeks ago, and they had their funeral on uh, Thursday. And we're thankful that the Lord has kept and worked in that situation, and we pray for the whole family at this time. And there are others who need our prayers there are people who are returning to school and to college and some of our children have returned to college and parents might be anxious and we're praying for you as well. And if you've got any needs and you want to uh, get in contact with us, then feel free. If you need a Bible, then get in contact with us as well. We have uh, been given a, a consignment of Bibles to give away free of charge because the word of God is free. We wanted to give it to you if you're interested in finding out more about the gospel. Well, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our might, almighty and glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one and one in three, the one who dwells in inapproachable light, the one who is holy, the Holy One of God. Behold the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, the creator of all. The psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night giveth praise. There is no place where their voice is not heard. O Lord, thou hast created all things. All things owe their existence to thee. There is nothing living in this universe. Every living thing owes its existence to thee. There is nothing beyond thy care, beyond thy sight, beyond thy observation. Lord, people, scientists, astronomers are exploring the nearer part of the, our universe. But Lord, thou dost know it all. It is all comprehensible to thee. The Bible says that thou sittest on the circle 
of the earth. That thy throne is a magnificent throne. That it reigns supreme over all. That there is nothing beyond thy power. And thou art able to turn hearts to thyself. And we thank thee, Lord, this morning for the gospel. Because the gospel, we believe, is the power of God unto salvation. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. There, Lord, this gospel has transformed lives. Men and women and boys and girls need this gospel. It's the gospel of God's power, of God's grace, of God's mercy, of God's salvation. It's a gospel that's bound up in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's a gospel that was planned and purposed before the world began. It's a gospel of immeasurable grace, immeasurable love immeasurable power. It's a gospel that has worked throughout the centuries from even our first parents and their error and their sin in the Garden of Eden ere since that time, Lord. Thou hast had a people and a plan for thy, those people. And thou hast saved multitudes and multitudes over the centuries and over the eons and millennia. But Lord, today... The gospel has indeed been ignored by so many. And yet, Lord, we live in a day when people are carrying around great weight of guilt. And they think man-made psychology and philosophy can help them. And it can't. This guilt, O oh Lord, because of their sin and their, their, er their disobedience to God. And their defiance of his word. And we pray, O oh God, this morning, may the grace of God come and transform souls this morning. Pray for the young people in our church who seem to want to go the way of the world. Draw them back, we pray. Arrest them as they're on their broad road that leads to destruction. Arrest them as they're on their downward spiral to Jericho. And have mercy upon them, Lord. We pray for those who once upon a time walked with the Lord and, and sang for the Lord and lived for the Lord. And now their testimony is in ruins and rags and they're living like the world and they speak like the world and they act like the world. Nor they have departed the city of blessing. They have departed the God of love and grace and they've gone into the world. And we pray, Lord, arrest them this morning. Lord, if there's a, a one dear one listening this morning who knows that's them, we pray that this message would arrow home to their hearts. We pray for our church service it's, and we pray for our ministry. We pray for those in our congregation. We pray, Lord, for Mr. and Mrs. Hart. And we thank thee, Lord, that the funeral uh, was a blessing to many, but we pray for the rest of the family who are mourning. Lord, speak to them, encourage them, and comfort them. Pray for others, Lord, who have lost loved ones recently. Pray for those who have been discouraged and dissuaded, even as thy people. Those who are feeling the loneliness of being shut in. Those, O oh Lord, who are feeling the, the ache of loneliness because they've lost loved ones. We ask, Lord, draw near to each one. We pray, Lord, even now be with our missionaries and those involved in gospel work. Use them, we pray. Pour out thy spirit upon us. Use this service for thy glory. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And this morning, we're looking at Luke chapter 10. Jesus, the good Samaritan. Jesus, the good Samaritan. Now, the Bible is full of wonderful illustrations. And our Lord Jesus was the master illustrator. He was a master storyteller. And as we turn to this passage of scripture this morning, I don't want us to miss the meaning of this account. This was a true account. The Lord Jesus was speaking to a real man. And we'll meet him in a moment. 
There are many good people in the world, kind-hearted, generous, charitable. And maybe you're someone like that this morning and you think that that's enough to get you to heaven. You think that it's good enough to get you to be right with God. Well, I used to be like that. I used to think if I'm a good person, if I'm kind and generous, then I'm sure to get to heaven. Maybe you've got a neighbor or a family member and you think if somebody could get to heaven by their good works, then that would be them. Maybe you're a young person, a child, a boy or a girl, and you look at your parents and you think, they're so kind and so good and so gracious and so helpful. They must be ready for heaven. And you see, it's no different to Jesus' day. There was a man, and he's a very influential man. And the road I'll speak about in a moment But there's a conversation going on in Matthew chapter 10, verses 25 to 29. And it's between two individuals. Now, I want you to note this. This is not a private conversation. This is a conversation that's going on between a scribe or a lawyer and the Lord Jesus Christ. But accompanying the Lord Jesus Christ is his disciples. And what the Lord talks about here is so important. Now, I want you to notice the topic of the conversation. You see, Luke records for us these words. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up. You see, he's important. And by the way, he's not a legal lawyer. The questioner here in verse 25, he's not a a man of of, um, state law or or, um, conveyancing. I know not much has been sold housewise at the moment, but he's not involved in selling houses or buying houses. No, he's got a higher purpose in life. He's involved in the law of God. He's a student of the law. And that's a good thing. Unfortunately, he's not a student of God's law. He's more a student and an expert in man's interpretation of God's law. And here he is. He stood up and he tempted him. Now that word could be translated as tested him. And it seems that the religious leaders were always testing the Lord Jesus, trying to trick him. And that's a foolish thing to do. How can you trick one who knows your very heart? As Jesus proved it when he spoke to Nathaniel. And he knew what was in Nathaniel's heart. But this is what the man said. Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the topic is a very important one. But the direction of conversation, the question itself, shows how little this man really knew. You see, he thought that he could do something to inherit eternal life. He thought that he could earn eternal life or merit eternal life, or that he could do something to please God enough that God would give him eternal life. Now that is a marvel, because religious people today are no different. They think that they can do something, or uh, go through a rite of passage, a ceremony, or a ritual, and therefore they have eternal life. You couldn't be further from the truth. You've missed the whole point. And you know, there are people that will read this passage this morning and just think, ah yes, I just need to do this and then I can have eternal life. I must go to church and I can have eternal life. Or I I must say my prayers and then I'll get eternal life. Or I must make some great religious journey and I'll get eternal life. But my friends, none of those things are possible. I tried all those things and failed. It was only when I finally came to my senses and yielded my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of my sins and trusting in him, which happened about 22 years ago, that I was given eternal life. So that's the first thing. But I just want you to notice something else. Eternal life is so misunderstood. Some people think they can have eternal life in the future. Way, way in the future. After I die, I was speaking to somebody recently, and they said to me, after I die, I'll have eternal life. And I said, no, my friend, if you're a Christian now, you have eternal life. Isn't that a marvel? 
You have eternal life right here and now. That's why the Christian is so assured. Even when we face troubles and even when we face the fear of death at times, as some of my dear friends have faced and gone past and into glory and have gone home to the, home to the Lord, they knew they had eternal life in this life. Because God had done a work in their heart. He had saved them from their sin. He had implanted the Holy Spirit in their lives. Well, isn't it a marvel that things don't change very much after all? This man wanted to do something to have eternal life. Maybe he thought, I can add to the pinnacle, to the temple. Or maybe he thought to himself, I could do something for this rabbi from Nazareth. But the Lord Jesus challenges them with the law and exposes his own sin. In verses 27 and 28, Jesus asked him, he said, Jesus asked him in 26, what is written in the law, the law of God, the true law of God? And the scribe says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He took this directly from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. That's the summary of the law. Of God, But you notice the emphasis. The first thing is to love the Lord thy God. How many people get it all wrong? They think the opposite. They think if they love their neighbor, then that's enough. And therefore they love God. No, 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 friends. No, 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 no. The Bible says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then you say, you notice the little word, all. And you say to me, how? How can I love God with all my heart, soul, mind and strength? If you're a thinking person, you'll be honest about it. You can't. We don't have the power or the capacity or the ability to love the Lord our God, even with a little strength on our own. And then Jesus says, thou hast answered right, this do and thou shalt live. In other words, you can't do this. You need something else. You need God's power, God's strength. You need God's help. And then in verse 28, verse 29, Jesus, the man says, He willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? He's forgot the whole point, forgotten the whole point. He's forgotten the fact that he doesn't actually love the Lord as God with all his soul, mind, and strength. So therefore he can't love his neighbor as himself. And then the Lord does something absolutely marvellous. Because the Lord Jesus knew the man's heart. And he talks about a road. And I want you to notice the road. The road there is in the bottom of the picture. And this is, by the way, the old road to Jericho. It's not the new road. The road is still there. But not many people travel this road. And I want you to notice the direction of the road. This picture, by the way, was taken... Co with our back to Jerusalem, looking down towards Jericho. And that's important. And I'll show you in a moment why. The Lord Jesus, I believe, told a story or a parable that had certain realistic elements. And one of them was this. He talks about a road. And of course, this scribe would have been very familiar with this road. This is the old road. This is the road everybody would have traveled. And, as, and he, Jesus says, and Jesus answering said unto him, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. It's a parable. Now, what is a parable? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning and a heavenly purpose. And the Lord Jesus tells us why he told parables. Because only those with spiritual insight will understand the meaning of the story. Most people, including myself, before I became a Christian, I read this parable and I thought, all I need to do now is be a good person and help the needy. And I missed the whole point of the parable. Because the Lord Jesus is answering the question that the man asked. How can I inherit eternal life? But there's something else here. What the Lord is doing here is marvellous. He's giving us an insight into his mission and ministry. And how he does it is wonderful. 
And I want you to see this. The parable is of a good Samaritan. One man puts it like this. There are three philosophies. The robber's philosophy. What you have is mine, and I will take it. The priest's philosophy had the philosophy that what is mine is mine, and I will keep it. But the Samaritan's philosophy, this is his philosophy, what is mine is yours, and I will share it. Now let's look at the parable. Let's see for ourselves what Jesus is really teaching us about here. He's teaching us some really important truths, some vital truths. I want us to notice, first of all, the sinner's root. The sinner's root. And I want you to see two things. I want you to see the two ways, of two directions he goes. I want you to notice in verse 30, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's going away from Jerusalem. Now, in the days of Jesus, Jerusalem was still seen as the city of God. It's where the temple was still established, where the sacrifices were offered, where many people went on special pilgrimages three times a year. But here this man is going away from Jerusalem. And is that not a picture of us all? We're going away from God. If we're not going towards God, we're going away. We're departing from blessing and from the presence of the Lord. He went not only away, but he went down. He went down. And I want you to notice this. He went down to Jericho. And one writer puts it like this. When we're going towards God, we're going upwards. When we're going away from God, we're going downwards. Down, down, down. This man is leaving Jerusalem to go to Jericho. And I wonder, is there someone listening this morning? And you are somebody who has been living as a sinner for many years. And you've been going as far away from God as possible. And the further you go from God, the further downwards you become. Maybe there's someone listening this morning and you were, grew up in a Christian home. And you heard the gospel. And the Lord was wrestling with your heart in your teenager years. And yet you've, you turned your back on him. And now you're living in the world. You turned away from God. And you've gone downwards. Can you remember? Can you remember the times when the Lord was dealing with you? And when you sensed even his love in a, in a gospel service. And yet, now look at you, friend. Oh, I've read of so many this week of young men, particularly young men. I'm speaking to the young men here. And they once upon a time sat under the gospel and they heard the gospel and their parents loved the gospel and they read the Bible to them and they went to Sunday school and they went to the gospel services. I read of a young man in Northern Ireland and he had grown up in a Christian home and his mum and dad loved the Lord but at the age of 17 sin got a hold of him and oh he departed from the Lord and for 12 miserable years, his life went further down and down and down. Until one morning, he awoke from his senses. He was in a drunken state. And he went out for a walk. And the word of God came with such power upon him as it hadn't done for many years. And it challenged him and it said, what doest thou here? And he thought of the man of the parable of the lost son. And he saw, came to his senses, and he had been eating swine's food, and he turned his back on his old life and began the long way back to the Lord. He went away, and he went downwards. And maybe you've done that. And is there hope? Of course there is. There's always hope with the Lord. Always hope with the Lord. Perhaps you think to yourself that I'm all right. But friend, 
There are only two roots in the world, two roots in life. There's either with God and going on with God or away from God and going away from God. And that's the point. Which route have you taken? All of us who are Christians this morning will say once upon a time we were on the broad road that led to destruction. We were on the sinner's route. But by God's grace and by his power, we're no longer on that road. Let me show you secondly something else. The sinner's route was the first thing. Secondly, the sinner's ruin. The sinner's ruin, and that's in our parable. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment, that's his clothing, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. They robbed him. They robbed him. Perhaps he had some money, a money bag. But once they'd robbed him, they took everything from him. And this is the picture of sin. It robs us. Oh yes, sin makes many promises to us. I marvel when I think of my own life how many promises sin made to me and yet it robbed me. And then sin not only robs us, it leaves us helpless, hopeless, powerless. Let me give you a word, immobilized. We're immobilized. You see, you might say, well, what are you talking about? I'm talking about anything we do when we're in sin can't please the Lord. If we're sinners this morning, if we're away from God, if we have never become been born again of the Holy Spirit, we're still in our sin and we're helpless. We're powerless. It doesn't matter what we do, even good things. They are no way of pleasing the Lord. Why is that? Because there's a great barrier between us. This great chasm between us. This great gorge between us. There's this great barrier of sin between us and God. But the Lord can change all that. But are you helpless in your sin this morning? Are you trying to improve yourself like this lawyer? Are you trying to improve yourself and yet you find that you can't do it? You don't have the power. You don't have spiritual power. Friend, let me share this. You'll never be able to help yourself. It's impossible. The Bible says that we're dead in transgressions and sin. The Bible says we're cut off from God. We're strangers to God. The Bible says that we are born in iniquity and conceived in sin. The Bible says that you and I are unable to please the Lord Unless he's gracious to us. Unless he's merciful to us. We're helpless. I know this is not popular, but it's true. When the Lord Jesus spoke about the men whom the Tower of Siloam fell upon, he says, if you die in your sin, you'll perish. So we've seen the sinner's root and the sinner's ruin. Now the sinner's religion. And maybe you're a religious person. And you're thinking to yourself, Well, I'm sure these two characters, the priest and the Levite, will help the poor man. He's left half dead. He's left helpless. He's not able able, able to drag himself to a place of safety. And see the religion. The priest. The priest. What does the priest do? The priest sees the man and passes by On the other side, he sees the man. Oh yes, perhaps he heard the man groaning, help me, help me. But the priest can't help him. Because as you will discover, and I had to discover, religion will never solve our greatest problem. Religion is all about our outward works. It doesn't matter what religion you look at. It's all about our performance To please our gods or our deities. But nothing can please the Lord when we're in our sin. Oh friends, this is the sinner's religion. Or the Levite, an expert in the law. Like the lawyer who Jesus is speaking to. And isn't that wonderful how the Lord just takes this man on a journey of his own ideas. And shows him as a Levite that he might be an expert in the law. But you see the reaction. They passed by on the other side. They ignored him. 
They saw him in his need and they ignored him. But then there's someone else. And this is the remarkable thing. We've seen the sinner's root. We've seen the sinner's <clears throat> ruin. Now let, we've seen the sinner's religion. Now let us look at someone who would never have been expected to be the hero of the parable. A Samaritan. A Samaritan. Well, there's this hypocrisy of religion. They've now come up. The Levite, the knowledge of God's law, and then the inability of religion. Nobody can help or save us. No religion can save your soul, my friend. Only Jesus Christ can. And this is the marvel. Let's look at the sinner's redeemer. And it's so surprising. The Lord Jesus does something that would make these Levites and scribes and priests draw breath aghast. Because for us, we're just reading a story. But for them, they're listening to this parable for the first time. Verse 33, a certain Samaritan as he journeyed. Samaritan? These are despised by the Jews. These are not serious people. These have a mixture of, of false religion and true truth. A Samaritans, you can find out more in John chapter 4 of what they believed. They believed that their city was more important than Jerusalem. They didn't really believe in much of the Old Testament. They took what they wanted. And indeed, that's common today. Some people want a little bit of Christianity and a little bit of Islam and a little bit of Hinduism and make it all together. But here we have the Samaritan. And he's the Redeemer. He's the man who saves this poor man who's on the road and the Samaritan is journeying the same way he's going the same way as the Levite and the priest but notice something in remarkable isn't it remarkable how this works out I want you to notice five things under this heading the first is this he comes to the man he comes to the man Instead of passing by like the other two, he comes. Secondly, he has compassion upon him. Verse 34, he went to him. Or in the original, he went. And implication, he went to him and bound up his wounds. He bandaged his wounds. Pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast. The oil would have been to soothe the pain and the bruises that the man had, had inflicted upon him by the robbers, but also he poured in wine. That's an antiseptic. It wouldn't have been very strong wine, but it would have been strong enough. And isn't this something else? He cleanses him. He washes him. He has never met the man before. They're complete strangers. But the Samaritan is there to help him. Fourthly, he carries him. He takes him up. He drags him, if you like. Imagine a man, he's half dead. He's got no energy. And the, the Samaritan just takes the man lovingly, carefully, almost if he had a football injury. And he's leaning on his shoulder. And he takes him to his beast, to his own beast. Most likely it was a donkey. And he puts him up on the donkey's back. And he conveys him to an inn. He pays for him. The man has no money. We don't know the name of the man. But we call him the sower has no money. And yet the Samaritan pays for him. He brings him to the local inn. Perhaps the inn was just down the way. But they arrive at the inn. And the innkeeper is well paid for his services. And I want you to notice this. This is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He comes. You and I, friends, are pictured here in this parable. If you're not a Christian this morning, or if you're a half, if you're a, a, a say you're a Christian, but you've never been truly converted to Christ, if you've never had God's power in your life and never known the power of the Spirit in your life, then you're like this man who's half dead. And you're powerless, you're helpless, you're hopeless, you're immobilized by your sin. You're trying to make an effort to please the Lord, but you're always coming up short. See what the Lord does? He comes. 
He comes down to the person who's helpless and they're crying and they say, Lord, have mercy. And the Lord comes and he has compassion. He has mercy and he cleanses us. He washes us, not with oil, but he washes us with his blood. And then he carries us. He bears us up and he pays for us. He pays for our redemption. Has Christ paid for your redemption? Has he paid for your salvation? How can Christ pay for my salvation, says somebody? He paid for it with his blood. He didn't pay for it with gold or silver, because that's no effect. That doesn't work currency in the presence of God, but his own blood. Has Christ come to you? Has he had compassion upon you? Has he cleansed you? Has he carried you? Has he paid for you? then you are one who can say, I know my Redeemer liveth. Where did Jesus carry away our sin? Says somebody, where did Christ pay for my salvation? Well, at the end of the Gospel of Luke, you discover the same Lord Jesus, no longer walking the roads of Jericho or Jerusalem, but on a cross. And there he is dying on the cross for, for people like you and me. And there he is as the Redeemer, paying the ultimate price for our salvation, securing our pardon with his blood. He's the sinner's Redeemer. Maybe there's someone listening and saying, oh, that I could have him. Oh, that I could know him. Let me share, fifthly, the Savior's remedy. It's marvelous. He uses wine as a sign of conviction. He challenges us. About our sin, the Holy Spirit comes and he does that preparatory work. And then there's something else. The oil of the gospel. The oil of the gospel. Oh, what a thing, friends. To know that the oil of the gospel has been applied to our souls. And that we're right with God this morning. The oil of the Holy Spirit. When the Lord Jesus Christ saves a soul, the Holy Spirit comes into the heart and makes them new. This is the remedy that God has prescribed and this is what Jesus came to do and this is what he's telling us in this parable. But then let me show you finally, number six, the sinner's recovery. Oh, it's marvelous. It's permanent. Once we are cleansed by Christ, we will never be the same again. And secondly, once we become a child of God, we'll never be a child of the devil again. We'll never be dominated by sin and by our old nature. There'll be a constant struggle going on. But oh, when Christ saves us, we're saved forever. And then there's one last thing. Once we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we'll never be without him again. Once... You're cleansed once you become a child of God. Once you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You'll never, ever be left alone again. But just very quickly in conclusion. We've seen the sinner's root. The sinner's ruin. The sinner's religion. The sinner's redeemer. The saviour's remedy. And the sinner's recovery. What about you? What about you? What do I need to do this morning? How can I know Jesus Christ as my saviour? How can I know my sins are forgiven? Well, here's some pointers. Recognise, first of all, you are a sinner. Now, that may not be popular today, but it's true. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let me say this. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We wrong God. We defy God. We disobey God because that's our natural heart's disposition. That's our natural direction. But we must recognize we're sinners. Maybe you didn't recognize that before. Maybe the Holy Spirit is showing you this morning that you're the man who's on the road robbed by life. Robbed by your lifestyle. Living totally contrary to God's word and you know it. Recognize it, friend. Admit it. 
Secondly, repent. Repent of all your known sin and unknown sin. You see, there are sins in our lives we don't even realize we're doing. And the Lord sometimes needs to show us them. I'll tell you a story. I remember a time when I was doing door-to-door in London. I was with the London City Missioner. And we were going door-to-door. And I met this man and his and I thought it was his wife. And they seemed for all the world to be in love with each other. They were only a young couple. And I, I said to them, I said, and they said, well, I'm a Christian. I said, oh, really? Yes, I'm a Christian, but my wife is not. Sorry, not my wife, but my, my girlfriend is not. And I looked at them and I said, you're a Christian? And you're living with a woman that you're not married to? And he said, well... Yes. Is that wrong? I said, well, my friend, who am I to judge? But the Bible tells us that we shouldn't be unequally yoked. And that we shouldn't be living with women or men before we, before we get married. We shouldn't be living as husband and wife. Do you know what he said? He said, you're the first person who's ever pointed out to me that that was a sin. Now, I don't know whether what happened after that. But he didn't even realize he was in sin. He was living in sin. That may have been a barrier between him looking, returning to the Lord. So we need to recognize we're sinners. We need to repent of it. We need to realize we cannot save ourselves. It's impossible to save ourselves. The chasm is so great. The barrier is so massive. The mountain of sin that has mounted up against our account is so enormous. But when you realize that, you won't look to yourself to save yourself. You look to the Lord. And I trust, friend, he'll save you there and then. And then finally, rely upon Christ alone. You see, Christ came to the man who was in such a terrible state and he saved him. And I believe he can save you too. 22 years ago, I heard this message preached on the radio. I'd never heard a message like it before. I'd never realized that the Good Samaritan was a picture of Christ. If this is your first time ever tuning into us and you want to find out more, then please get in touch. Maybe you're someone that's been listening for a while and you're wondering, what is it about this church or what is it about these people that makes them so different? It's because we recognize we're sinners. And we sought salvation, not in ourselves, not in religion, but in Jesus Christ. We trust in him alone, and he's made all the difference in the world. Well, if you've got any questions, get in touch, but let's bow our heads in a closing word of prayer. Our gracious Father and loving heavenly... uh, Our gracious Father and loving Saviour, we thank thee this morning for all thy mercies to us. Bless us, speak to us, encourage us and direct us. O Lord, work in hearts this morning. May someone be saved this very morning. May the Holy Spirit come with such power that the Lord Jesus Christ will come to souls and save them this very moment in their rooms. Pray, Lord, for children and older people, for older children and also for young people, youth that have heard the gospel and not yet repented of their sins. Oh, Lord, draw them to thyself, we pray. Pray for those who have turned their back on the Lord. Oh, Lord, they heard the gospel. They knew the gospel. They even seem to have professed faith in Christ. They're backslidden. They're in in the world. We pray, Lord, draw them them back to thyself this morning we thank thee for christ and that he loves us and he gave his life at calvary to save us bless us and keep us this day in jesus name amen our final hymn is just <clears throat> jesus loves me this i know for the bible tells me so
Well, if you've been challenged by that message and you want to find out more about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, you want to know Jesus Christ as your saviour, then please get in touch. We've got literature, we've got a website that you can go to and find out more about the gospel. You can even go to our YouTube channel. There's a, um, I've just uploaded a few um, evangelistic messages. One of them is called, Am I Too Good to be Saved? And uh, you can uh, find out more about the, the gospel. We want you to know Christ, friend. We want you to know him. We want you to know what it is to be saved. These are uncertain times. People don't know what the future holds, but the Lord holds the future. And also for the Christian church, we want to encourage ourselves to go on with the gospel and to share this marvellous gospel with everyone we meet. Well, let's bow in a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Father, we thank thee for this day. We thank thee for thy word and we thank thee for the gospel. Oh, it's wonderful to have a gospel to preach. A gospel that is powerful to save. Lord, we were once immobilized by our sin, powerless, helpless, dead in our transgressions and sin. But as thy people, thou hast saved us. And we pray, multiply that miracle of salvation across the airwaves today. May many, many people hear the gospel of salvation, repent of their sin, and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. We thank thee for hearing our prayers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.